spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then skipping down to verse 20, it says, at that day, ye shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. So not only now is it Christ with you like it was back uh, 2,000 years ago, but Christ with you. So Christ in you means a lot of things. And I don't fully understand and know all the things that it means for me and all the ways that it changes me. It should change me and that it impacts my life. But there are at least five things that we could look at that it affects us, ways that it affects us. So Christ in you means a changed life and a hopeful life, a directed life, an empowered life, and a fulfilled life. So those are five things we want to look at this morning and see how that, it, uh, how that we're affected when Christ is in us. So the first one, a changed life. If God is not in control, then we are out of control as Brother David Lee mentioned in a message a few years ago, if we are not under his control, we are as good as being completely out of control. So every powerful force in the world around us here needs to have some type of a force greater than itself to control it or else it's an out of control situation. If you can imagine a vehicle going down the road, it needs something greater than itself to control it or else we would say it's an out of control situation. If there's a fire burning somewhere, we always want to make sure that it's under control so that it's not an out of control situation. If there's plumbing in our house and, and water being carried by pipes to certain places in the house, we want that water to be controlled by something stronger than itself, uh, a, a PVC pipe, for example, with a 300 pound pressure uh, rating so that the water can be under control, something greater than itself. Now we as, as people that God has made with tremendous abilities and talents and, and knowledge, the potential for knowledge, we definitely need to be under control by something greater than ourselves. It's not enough for us to control ourselves and for us to be held under the control of, of people like us. For example, a government even with strong and powerful governments, things still go wrong in this world today. So we need something greater than ourselves to keep us under control. And Christ does, does this for us. If he is within us, we have a changed life, a life that's transformed and brought under control. And as he does this for us, then we, we can face the fiery darts of the devil and we can have the assurance that he will be there uh, to help us withstand those things. Um, he takes temptations and he makes them abhorrent to us. And those things are things that we no longer just see the attractiveness of it, but we also see the despicable nature of the temptation. God gives us the opportunity to have a, a certain measure of sovereignty in our lives. We can kind of make our own choices to a certain extent. We're given free will. God gives us a choice of how much of his rule we allow in our hearts. But the devil isn't so much that way. He isn't so generous. If you give him an inch, he will become a ruler. He'll become a ruler in our hearts. He'll become a ruler in our lives. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And so this is, is showing how that Christ, as he comes and dwells in us, then we can, we can be changed from being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel and we can now be uh, uh, covenants of the promise and we can have hope and not be without God in the world and we can be 
made nigh by the blood of Christ, as this scripture says. So this change that we experience brings a hope with it. We, we go from this destitute situation where we were without Christ, we were aliens, we were strangers, we had no hope, and we were without God, and we were afar off. All of those things are mentioned in this, these two verses that I just read. But this change brings about a hope for the future and that our lives don't have to be that same way under that same oppressive uh, effect of the God of this world. So change brings hope. Change and hope, they go together. And those words might ring a bell because those words were repeated over and over again by a, a certain man who was running for a political office in this country. And he used them effectively to bring about a historic election. And there was this message that spoke to the need that we all have. Those are powerful words, hope and change. And it was effective. We, as the people God has made, need something much more than the government, though, to bring about this change and to give us a true hope. But change does bring hope. So what the other thing that we can look at that Christ in you brings is a hopeful life. And as we're changed, as Christ gives us that changing power as he comes within us, then we can have hope in our lives and a life that's empowered by hope. So the second thing we'll look at is the hopeful life. And this is uh, the context in which uh, we have our text verse today. And the, the context though that we use the word hope today is so often different, I think, from what the Bible uses it. For example, we might say, I hope it rains this week, or let's hope this hurricane season isn't too severe this year. Those are things that we have no control over, but we're just hoping that it turns out okay. We have no way of bringing the rain, but we just hope that it comes. And so it makes it seem like hope is some impotent and weak thing. It's just kind of like a, a limp rag. And so why is it listed in there with those three great things, faith, hope, and love? Well, obviously, hope must have some other type of power that goes beyond that limp rag that's only good enough to maybe wipe away tears when the time gets tough. Faith is strong, and it takes its substance from hope itself. And that's what the Bible says. The substance of things hoped for is what faith is. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So God has bestowed his love upon us, that we can be called the sons of God. And what I want to do is, is read 1 John 3, 1, 2, and 3, and we'll see where this leads to. But in this first verse here, it's talking about how that we can't, we can't really expect the world to really love us, to understand us any more than what they did Jesus. Now, if they get to know us in a real way, then of course things could change. But at first glance, does the world understand me? And do I understand the world? Is there some kind of a, a resonance there? Do I have the love of the world in me? How well does the world understand me, and how well do I understand the world? Maybe that can be a test. Does the way the world operate seem strange and foreign to me? When I see the, way, the things that happen in the world and the things that the world is involved in and their thought patterns, is that all strange and foreign to me, or are there some things about it that's appealing. 1 John 3, 1 says that uh, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. The world can't understand us and we can't understand the world. We're in different paradigms. We're in different kingdoms. And then 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, 
We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So this, this talks about the future. It gives us hope here. And it says in verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So it directly mentions that this is a hope. And then it goes on to say that this hope has a particular strength and a power that's actually purifying. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure, even as Jesus Christ himself is pure. So this means that hope is more than just a feeling. It has a cleansing and a sanctifying effect in our lives. And then we can look further. Romans 8.25, you don't need to turn to that, just a short verse. It says, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The things that we don't see, the things we've been told about, if we look at those things with hope, not just a mental assent that they exist and it may be a part of our future, but we look forward to those things, the promises of Christ that he gives us with a hope, then it says, the Bible says, that we are actually empowered with patience to wait for it. Now, this patience here, it, it kind of goes beyond our general usage of the word today as well. Um, apparently, according to Bible references, uh, and dictionaries or uh, the Greek word study, patience means cheerful or hopeful endurance. And so this is giving the connotation that it allows us to be able to endure all the difficulties that we go through as we wait for this hope to manifest itself in reality. So hope is a powerful thing. And we can look at some practical illustrations too. For example, if I really hope to do something, I'll just let you fill in the blanks there. If I really hope to fill in the blank, then I'm more likely to prepare for it or save for it than if I don't really care. Uh, for example, Floyd and Prudence, if they really hoped to be able to move out of their uh, trailer that was waxing old as doth a garment, like the Bible says everything in this world does, and move on into a house if they really hoped to do that, then they were much more likely to save and to prepare for this and make plans. And then it was an empowering effect on them. So you just think of yourself and the things that you work toward. If you really have a hope that this will actually happen, then it, you're much more likely to uh, move forward into that, that, that plan. And you have a hopeful endurance and a cheerful endurance as well. You have that patience as you wait for that hope to manifest itself or to uh, come to fruition. I'd like to read another uh, portion of scripture. First Samuel chapter 28, verses one through nine. That has a story there, a story about the loss of hope and the effects that can come from that. And it's a story about King Saul 1 Samuel 28, we'll start reading in verse 1, and we'll just read all the way through to verse 9. And just notice here how that Saul was in a situation where he had given up hope and see where it led. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war, warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Remember that. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. Then said Saul to his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that it may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit, 
at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up, bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that hath familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? I'll just read one more verse. And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And this, has, this happened as a result of Saul losing hope. So Saul had taken the wizards and those with familiar spirits out of the land because he knew that they were wrong and they were the wrong source of revelation, the wrong, wrong source of hope. But when he came to the point where he had lost hope, he actually turned to those things that he had himself turned away from before and commanded everyone else to turn away from. He somehow put them out of the land. I don't know how he did it. Did he uh, put them in prison? In prison, did he exile them? Did he put them to death? We don't know, but he put them out of the land. And of course, he missed one, apparently. And so this gives an example of how that sometimes we could catch ourselves doing the same thing. How many times have we been resolved to trust in God instead of our own abilities, only to turn around and catch ourselves reverting back to being t tempted to rely on our own strength and to stand instead of Christ. In essence, putting hope in ourselves, in those things that in the past we've seen as dangerous to do that. And the Bible talks about what happens when every man does that which is right in his own eyes, and it's never a good outcome. If I do that which is right in my own eyes, if I turn to myself for hope, then I can expect disaster to follow. Man's ways leads to an, a hopeless end, and God's ways leads to endless hope. So Christ in you means a hopeful life and a changed life. And then thirdly, Christ in you means a directed life. Christ, if he is in us, he is a powerful force. He is the the. Uh, the source of all power in the universe. All power is given to me in heaven and earth, he said. So if he is in us, then he will direct us. Uh, if we allow him to dwell in us and take control of our life, then there will be a strong source and sense of direction to do what's right and to do what's holy, pure, and good. And it's kind of like some of the things that he has made in this, on this earth that he directs himself as well through a thing called instinct. And I'm thinking of migratory birds. And they have something that's unseen and within themselves, just like Christ is in us in a similar way. And that gives them direction and it guides them. You've, most all of us have probably seen little hummingbirds. Some of us have hummingbird feeders outside the window. And we can watch those little ruby throat hummingbirds coming up and uh, drinking of that nectar and they're so tiny so small they're actually smaller than what we think they are uh, they they only weigh about one eighth of an ounce so to put that in perspective if you would want to send a hummingbird in the mail you could get a, a, a standard envelope and put a single stamp on it and add eight hummingbirds into the envelope before you'd have to add an extra stamp so there's these tiny little things and they have an endurance that's beyond what we can imagine and even a directing force that's astounding for such a tiny little creature. When you look at those hummingbirds when they first come in March or April, those first hummingbirds, the first day that you see it there, it's very likely that that hummingbird could have been in Mexico the day before uh, drinking nectar from flowers down there. And what they do is they fly across the Gulf of Mexico all the way over here to Florida, Georgia, and this area when we see them here. So this is a, a trip that can be up to 500 miles long, and these hummingbirds are flying over the ocean, and it's a nonstop flight. It's just amazing that such a little bird, such a light bird, has the energy reserves to go that far. Now, of course, before they start the journey, they, they uh, eat lots more 
or drink lots more nectar and eat little bugs to put on energy reserves. That's all a part of the directing, guiding force within them that tells them to do that. And then they start their journey. So they spend October through February in Mexico, and then they fly across the Gulf of Mexico nonstop. Now, historic, you know, in the past, there haven't been any uh, stopping points for them along the way, but now since oil drilling uh, rigs have been built there in the Gulf, some of the uh, workers on the oil rigs will see hummingbirds sitting down on the rigs for a rest uh, during their migration. But if there's no oil rigs there, they have to keep flying. So these little birds, they fly nonstop up to five, 500 miles, and that will take them 18 to 22 hours. Another thing that's just amazing about these birds is that migratory birds normally fly in flocks, but these birds, they set out on their own. When the little voice or the little instinct inside them tells them it's time to go, they just up and leave just like that and they're gone. And they fly all the way across the Gulf of Mexico to come here with no one with them, no one to give them uh, the confidence that we're going to make this together or no one to give a confirmation that this is the right time to go because they're flying along with me but they go on their own. It's a solitary migration all, the way, all by themselves all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a sign of a directing and a guiding force. And this is what Christ can do for us. There's another bird by the name of the uh, bar-tailed godwit. This bird uh, flies across the Pacific Ocean and it also has a nonstop flight. And it lifts off and it starts flying and it's got a much farther uh, way to go. Much more distance is involved here. And so when it takes off and starts flying, it doesn't land until about nine days later. So it has this continual time of flying nine days across the Pacific Ocean. In this time period, it travels over 7,000 miles and it flies fast enough that the speed is equivalent to, to driving from Florida all the way up to Ontario, Canada in one 24-hour day. It can cover that much ground. And it's a tremendous journey for this bird to take from the South Pacific Ocean all the way up to the North Pacific Ocean, the, 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 of course, the land there in those areas. So this bird is another example of having a directing and a guiding force. It's an unseen guide within. And that's what it means to have a directed life. It means that a terrifying task can be accomplished that this bird can set out to fly across the Pacific Ocean with no place to land, no, no, uh, nothing to eat. It just has to go. No place to sleep. And the reason that researchers know this is because they've tagged these birds. You can put transponders on them and you can track them and see exactly where they go and how long it takes them to get there and if they stop or not. And it's, it's amazing to see how they actually make those migrations. So the, the lesson in this is that Christ within us directs us, just like the instinct within the birds direct them. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So this is the Comforter also called the Spirit of Truth. So I want to skip down to verse 13 now. It says, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So Jesus Christ has given us the spirit of truth, and this is a spirit from God himself, from Jesus Christ, and from God the Father, that will guide us into all truth and will direct us. Jesus has said, or God has said that he will guide us with his eye. So as God guides us and he directs us and he shows us the things that we need to do and he provides for us, just like those little birds, that it reminds us that there are times when we need to step out on our own and do the things that he expects of us and that we are expected to uh, be victorious over temptation. 
And there are things that we're faced with sometimes that bring about a lot of pressure. Maybe there's a lot of pressure for us to, like the bird, uh, not do something that we're called to do. The bird might want to just stay right where he is instead of uh, facing that uh, harrowing journey across the ocean. For us, maybe sometimes it's a pressure not to do something that we, we know we should be called to do. Maybe there's a peer pressure. Maybe there is a, a pressure of, uh, that comes from past experiences in life that <coughs> cause us to want to go a certain way. Maybe there's things like pressure on, on how we actually present ourselves to the world around us. And I want to be careful how I say this because the Bible says that the body is more than raiment. But, and we could apply this to the church too, the body of Christ is more than the raiment that we put on. But one thing I had to think of is that we as a church together, all of us, if we are members of this body, we have agreed together to present ourselves in a certain way. And do we, are we faithful to that? There are some things that, that, I'm not talking about, for example, just the other evening, there was uh, a recreation of Noah's Ark that came through, and there were some, some people on there that were dressed up as, as animals on the ark. But there are times when we are presenting ourselves, and is it really what we have agreed before God and the people of the church to do? Have, have we gone beyond that? Sometimes God wants us to come close to him to where that we can actually find a, a, a sense of direction in a real way. And there's been a story that's been told of a young man and an old preacher, and I probably won't get all the details right, exactly right, but uh, from, from what I understand, the young man had lost his job. And so he was basically at rock bottom, and he went to the old preacher and he was just so devastated that he came in the room and he started to tell him all these things that had happened he just poured out his heart and he was so frustrated and he told the preacher how he lost his job and all these things were going wrong and he started to walk around pacing the room and finally he just cried out and he said i've been begging god to tell me something why doesn't god answer my prayer and he was quiet and the old preacher, he said something on the other end of the room, but the young man didn't understand. And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. And he walked across the room to get closer to the preacher. And the preacher said it again, but this time it was still just as soft as a whisper. And the young man said, I'm sorry, I still couldn't hear you. And he walked over to the, young, to the preacher's chair and he leaned down against the chair. And with his... And the preacher's heads bowed together. He heard the preacher say, God sometimes whispers. So we will move closer to him. This time the young man heard and he understood. He understood that sometimes God isn't doing what we want him to do when we want him to thunder through our troubles and our problems but he wants us to move close to him so that he can hear, so that we can hear his voice. His voice is not necessarily the voice of the thunder and the earthquakes and the fire, but it's the still small voice that we calm ourselves, our spirit, and we listen to the spirit of truth and the comforter in that still small voice as we move close to him. Until my head is bent before his, and then as I listen is when I find my answer. Better yet, it's at that point that I find myself closer to God. So we draw close to the source. The source of what? The source of all. That's what Jesus is. He's the, the source of everything. Uh, he's the source of all good things, every good and perfect gift. He's the source of all things that have been created. He is God the creator. Now we can also live an empowered life in Revelations 
chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, uh, talks about some of this empowerment that we can have. John heard a voice in heaven. He says this, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. So we have this, this revelation here in the book of Revelation that there is power in Christ. And so as Christ comes within us, then we are empowered as well. Second Corinthians 12, 9, you don't need to turn to that. It says, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, excuse me, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ may rest upon me if I simply just glory in my infirmities instead of uh, pushing my own way. Paul says here, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then another verse, Ephesians 1.3, uh, ex ex explains how there's power in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so it's speaking of how that we can be in him. We can be before him in love. And we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And this is empowering for us. Ephesians 1.19 also says, what, what, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So, if God is for us, who can be against us? So, the obstacle before us is never as great as the power behind us or within us. If Christ is within us, all the obstacles that we face are dwarfed in comparison to that power that's within us. So, we can have that empowered life by having Christ within. Christ within you, the hope of glory. Then we can also see how that, as we look, as we've looked at how that Christ in you means a changed life and a hopeful life, as well as a directed life and an empowered life. Now, finally, we can also notice how that Christ in you means that we can have a fulfilled life. So, as He changes, strengthens, directs, and empowers. In essence, He provides the full experience of life, a filled experience in life, so it's a fulfilled life. A full experience and a filled experience, and we have the fulfilled life, and that comes from Christ. So Jesus gives us this promise, and we're told that there's no good thing that he will withhold from the upright. And we are also told that we can serve the Lord with gladness. And so this is what we can do if we are actually having a fulfilled life. We can feel like it's coming from a heart that we serve him gladly. And it's a thing that we can be happy to do. It's, it's fulfilling for us to serve him. And as we serve him, of course, he will make sure that every good and every perfect gift is available for us. Because he said no good thing will he up withhold from the, from the upright. And so as we serve the Lord with gladness in this fulfilled life, this fulfilling experience that we have with him, then we can understand that with Christ, we can have both the hope of glory and the glory of hope. So Christ in you, the hope of glory, as we read in our text verse uh, again, Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you the hope of glory so it's a tremendous privilege that we can have to have christ being willing to to, to to live in our hearts to dwell in us and make so that we can be rooted and grounded in him and built up in that most holy faith so again with christ we can have both the hope of glory and the glory of hope i think i will close with that i would appreciate if you brother Irvin, could have a uh, a testimony or corrections or whatever you would uh, choose to say.
thank you for that. Is there anything else that any of you would have that you would like to say? Okay, if not, let's kneel for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been gracious to us and that in your greatness and your glory, you've been willing to send Jesus Christ, your only Son, down to this sin-cursed world to redeem us, to save us from our lost estate. And we thank you that as it came time for him to leave and to go back to his eternal abode, that you were willing to send to us the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth that can guide us, that can direct us, and that Christ can be within us through that Spirit. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to reach out to you and, and your Godhead in this way, through this avenue that you have given us, and help us to be um, always committed to the truth and to being directed and to be led by your spirit. And we thank you for the direction that you give us in your word as well, that we can read and we can clearly understand uh, what your will is for our life. And we thank you too for the, the story that we can learn from of what it means to stand firm for you and to, to be strong in the Lord, the power of his might, as we have studied what the, the three Hebrew boys did in the face of the fire. And when the fiery trial is upon us, we pray that you would help us to be just as faithful, just as committed, and just as strong. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, and we ask that you would help us to reciprocate this back to you, and that you would help us to all be faithful to each other as well. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been richly blessed here again this morning. It's been a wonderful privilege to be able to be together. And as I think of what we want to do next here in this little time together, I thought of how both the devotional and the message had a connection with what we're looking forward to. Thinking of things with eternal value and things will, that will not burn up. We think especially of a person, an individual, opening their heart to God and being born again of the Spirit of God and then desiring to be baptized. With that comes the testimony of Christ being within and that being our hope of glory. And we, along with that, experience the glory of hope. So. The Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is open for anyone. This morning we're thinking especially of those that have recently made known to us their desire for baptism. And as we have in the past, we really wanted to give them opportunity to, to share with us, you know, what Jesus means to them, something relating to Christ being within them, their hope of glory. So that is what we want to do now for each of you that are looking forward to baptism. Uh, we want to give you time to just share what is on your heart. And I think we mentioned a week or so ago when you stand, if you would turn and face the congregation and just share what's on your heart and mind. And there is quite a number of you, thankfully. So. Maybe just for order, if you know your order of age, you know who's the oldest of the young brothers first, uh, you can share, and then the same way, uh, the young sisters. If you don't know who's oldest or youngest, it's fine. Uh, doesn't have to be that way. But we want to give you opportunity now. So um, why don't we just... Uh, pause here, close our eyes, and have a time of prayer together as we think of these youth getting ready to give their testimony to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have made possible the wonderful privilege and blessing of having Christ in us, indeed our hope of glory. Lord, we thank you for each of these youth. We thank you for each one that have made known to us their desire to be baptized upon the confession of their faith. 
as a testimony of them knowing you through Jesus. We pray that you would just be with them now even as they stand to, to make known, to share what's on their heart this morning. Pray you would just bless each one of them. Pray for each of their parents and us as a church family as we would endeavor to be in support of them and their walk with you. It's in Jesus' name with thanksgiving we pray. Amen. So, youth, uh, you brethren, first of all, we'll give you opportunity uh, to stand and share what you have. Stand and face the congregation and share what's on your heart. So, Kyle, yes. That Kyle? Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Morgan? Yeah. 
certainly was a blessing to hear each of your testimony and those words you had to share. May God bless you for giving those expressions from your heart, and we wish you God's blessings as you continue walking with the Lord. We have been praying for you, want to continue, and we as a church family want to be faithful in that. And so there are quite a few other announcements. Uh, I trust I'll be reminded if we miss something here further. The offering that will be taken today will be for the medical aid fund and it's planned for the school fund for next Sunday. We do look forward to coming together this evening. Service begins at seven o'clock. All of you as visitors would be welcome. Uh, Brother Sanford plans to have devotions. Brother Elmer M plans to have the topic I want to pray for you, look forward to that service. And we would like to meet with those of you that, are, that just gave your testimonies at 6 o'clock this evening. We would plan for that. Wednesday evening a week ago, we had a meeting here. Uh, quite a number were not here. There was one of the finance committee asked that we would make copies of what was shared that evening and put those in the mailboxes. So just that you know that's why those are there. Some of you have also been waiting for Calvary Bible School applications to come. Those are here now. There's a few on the table, in the foyer in the back. For Wednesday evening, we plan to come together for a service. Uh, Brother Gary plans to have devotions. Andrew plans to have children's class. And then Brother Morris is going to have something further for us. It's possible that it might be about children's ministry or something. Uh, that's to be fully decided yet. Wanted to give the plans that have been made concerning Thelma Yoder's, uh, her death, the uh, visitation and funeral. Of course, uh, that would be Sim Yoder's mother from Dublin. And we have some visitors here this morning that have come with plans of attending that funeral. Visitation is planned for Tuesday afternoon from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, again 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the evening. Those, that visitation is planned to be at Emmanuel Christian Fellowship at that church, Emmanuel Christian Fellowship. The funeral is planned for 10 o'clock Wednesday morning, and that will be at the Buckeye Baptist Church in Wrightsville, Georgia. Buckeye Baptist Church in Wrightsville, Georgia, 10 o'clock Wednesday morning. Gerald and Mary came from Costa Rica with plans of attending the funeral. And Brother Gerald did consent to preach for us next Sunday morning, Lord willing, unless something comes up. And he asked that we'd be preaching for him. Uh, excuse me, praying for him. I uh, sometimes I, I say the wrong word at the wrong time. But uh, to preach for us, we want to pray for him. Let's remember that as we go through this week. And then uh, you brethren especially will remember, probably most of us know that uh, Brother Micah some time ago sent out a text message asking for anyone to respond that would have an interest or be open to hosting exchange students from other countries. And there is a young man by the name of George that is actually planning to come this coming Friday uh, Micah and Rose are planning to host George in their home uh, for, for a school term up to nine, ten months or so. And we just thought it would be well for the church family to know that, to know that there will be visitors coming, spending time with us, and that we use it as an opportunity of sharing the love of Jesus with them. The following week, Lord willing, there will be a young man, 15 years old, from Germany coming. His name is Conrad, and also a young man from Thailand. Uh, his name is very difficult to say. He goes by the name of JJ, which he says, that's okay, we can call him JJ uh, from Thailand. And uh, at this point, Bertha and I are hoping, planning to host those two young men, Conrad and JJ. So just that we know that, we'll have them here with us and that we uh, reach out to them as a brotherhood. Would there be any other announcements anyone would have today? Brother Daniel.
Okay, appreciate you mentioning that. We want to pray for you, Brother Daniel, as you go, both of you. Anything else anyone would have? If not, we will sing a song together while the offering is being taken, and then we'll look to Brother Morris to lead us in closing prayer. God's blessings to each of you. together.